big thank you to all of our corporate partners and our partners for continuing to support our efforts at uh, ARC 360 as the industry continues its evolution. Um, again, if you just signed in, have a little play around with the functionality of Zoom. Great session lined up today with some two, two uh, key speakers. So it's going to be a fascinating insight for us. Um, all of these webinars uh, and past webinars are recorded as well, and they're all available via the I Love Claims website as to uh, the recordings from last week's uh, ILC Motor Claims Festival. So some great sessions there to catch up on if you haven't done so already. So we will just, without further ado, move on to our little disclaimer. So the views and opinions expressed during the following webinar are those of the individual contributors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the contributors employer, organization committee or other group or individual. Please respect any all contributions and we encourage you to join the conversation by the interactive functions available. So today's panelists, we have Sean Carey, president of SCG Management Consultants, LLC, and we have Ian Thompson, group chief claims officer of Zurich Insurance. So let's jump across to the two guys. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I'll allow you both to to give a, a brief introduction uh, for those who some might be familiar, but others may not be so familiar with yourself. So, Sean, if I can come to you first, if that's okay. For sure, yeah. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, uh, good morning everybody. Trent and uh, Dean for your messages. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, have, I used to work in the collision repair industry in the UK many, many moons ago um, for my sins responsible for the Nissan Authorised Body Shop Programme. Um, and then when Carter and Carter decided it wanted to go and take control of the world, I was the guy that got in an airplane and flew out to America to, to go do that and set it up. And uh, eight years in, it was a fairly big organization. I left, I joined a company that was in the IT world at that point, which is now partly the foundation of the integral uh, technology. Um, and then went back out of my own consulting. I've been doing that now for about 15 years here in the U.S., um, consult with the OEMs, the, the large IT organizations, insurers to some respect, um, uh, and across the whole segment of the, uh, the automotive landscape here in the US. And internationally, I, I, I remain on the board of IBIS and, and get to keep a toe in the water in the UK sufficiently enough to, to know that all the City and Gill stuff that's been going on, I too, I'm City and Gills qualified in mechanical engineering, I'll have you know, 1982. Um, and I look forward to, to contributing today as best I can and giving you an insight into certainly what's going on in the US market, which is, um, I suspect, not terribly different to what's been going on across Europe and the rest of the world, as we will try and understand what this now normal look like. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sean. And uh, what are we, half past seven in the morning, did you say, when you joined we us? We are 7.30 just gone, I'm guessing, here in the US, in Chicago. It's, uh, it's going to be 94 and blistering hot today, and it was 94 and blistering hot yesterday, and it'll be 94 and blistering hot tomorrow, so uh, sorry. It sounds, to... it sounds, sounds very familiar to here in the UK, Sean, so uh, moving on quickly. Uh, <laughs> and over to yourself, Ian, if I may. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to join this panel today uh, and um, hope to give you some insight that I can share from, uh, from Zurich but also more broadly as well. So uh, for those who don't know me, I've been around in insurance for, well I used to say 25 years but that must be out of date so it must be close to 30 years now. I was 19 years with RSA latterly as um, Motor Claims Director in the UK and then moved across to Zurich in 2012, picking up the regional role as Chief Claims Officer and then moved to the group role just over 18 months ago. Um, so I think you'll know the Zurich brand in the UK. Obviously, we do a lot in municipal. We're quite big in commercial. Um, we also have quite a big uh, global footprint through what we call our international programs. So those companies, you know, McDonald's, um, a number of car manufacturers um, who have a global footprint and they want one insurance partner, whichever country that they operate in. But we're also pretty big in North America from a commercial perspective. We operate right across Latin America, Asia Pacific, um, and in, in Europe, obviously, we're big in Switzerland, Germany, 
Spain and Italy are our key markets, but we operate pretty much every Western European market as well. I only just say that not to blow the trumpet, more to kind of just give you a perspective on the scope of um, what I get involved with in terms of geography. Um, and clearly, um, like so many people um, working from home, my usual office is in Switzerland, but since um, we stopped international travel as a company, I've been basing myself out to the south coast of the UK. Um, I really need to have a cool background like Sean. I really dig the, uh, the the black scheme, Sean. That works really neatly. We're just in the middle of moving house. So literally, I've got packing crates around me. I'll move them all to one side to give a little bit of a, a clearer background. So apologies if uh, there's a little bit of background noise, a little bit of mess in the background as well. But looking forward to the session today and um, open up to pretty much any question that I can help on. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ian. And uh, background noise, background interruptions, it's all part of the new norm, isn't it? So we're all uh, very familiar with that by now. So again, great stuff, great opening. Uh, really appreciate your time today. What we are going to do is we are going to kind of, you know, stay on the UK for the, for the time being and just get a feel for what's happening to the market there. We've obviously got some uh, very loyal uh, followers in terms of the webinars over the week. So we just want to keep up the, uh, the data that we're presenting. So CAPS, um, again, a couple of weeks ago, we kind of announced that CAPS were changing from a weekly uh, data insight to monthly. So Kevin has gone away and done uh, these sums and various bits and pieces. And in terms of, if you like, normalize the data, we were starting to experience a little bit of a fluctuation in data because of obviously so much happening uh, on a week on week basis. So, uh, again, unique claims, a claim that is initiated in exchange for the first time within CAP system, supply chain transmissions, unique claim plus any additional transmissions on the same claim. And here we go. So, again, probably far more aligned in terms of general thoughts across the industry uh, right now. So end of June, back up to 60 percent in terms of unique claims, 62 percent in terms of supply chain transmissions. And this is normalized on January 2020 as being 100 percent. So uh, back on the way up, which is good, continuing that uh, upward trajectory. Um, again, measurements there it is claims volumes exchange so unique claims up on previous month by 20,620 and supply chain transmissions 54 or nearly 55,000 activity heat mapping so from in terms of integral so this data is pulled from enterprise customers i.e., those claims requiring an enterprise rental uh, which equates to about a third of all claims plus the addition of its own claims business data which handles claims for brokers and there's our heat map, uh, again, sort of London, southeast region, if you like, looking like the, the biggest hotspot right now. Um, and up 4% increased week in week claims volumes, 7% of volume coming from new postcodes and enterprise now active from 329 branches active. New hotspots, Derby, West Bromwich, Scunthorpe, Norwich, Hove and Birmingham. And there's those uh, postal hotspots, DE21, B70, DN15, NR2, BN3 and B11. And the top six by volume, uh, CM20, G1, E12, EH6, WV2 and LU1. Now, brilliant insights again in terms of the data there so fantastic thank you very much to caps and integral uh, and what i wanted to do just before we get into the conversation um again I caught up with sean and ian over the past week or so and something we did last week obviously when webinar wednesday um was absorbed by the ilc uh, motor claims festival and our time slot we did the great british motor claims survey so we had 137 people sitting on the survey uh, and a real split in terms of those taking part across the industry a copy of the survey is available from the i love claims website but i just wanted to put out four if you like key topic areas that i'm sure we're going to touch upon today so Timeline within people's businesses as of uh, 1st of July, so last week, key timeline focus within people's businesses, a real split there. Um, as you can see, uh, zero to three months, three to six months, six to 12 months, you know, 36, 36% and 28%. Um, and again, we'll discuss sort of uh, findings around there and if it, uh, if it fits with others' thoughts. 
Uh, what do you believe will be the short term six month impact of the crisis on people's driving behaviours? And again, uh, human behaviour is going to be a big part of this conversation, I think, today in terms of what Ian and Zurich, the Zurich team are finding. So 69% uh, felt that people driving less as a result of working from home or technology, 27% more people driving to maintain social distancing, 4% uh, no change. And again, this is sentiment. So this is what those 137 people who participated thought. Uh, by how much do you anticipate motor claims volumes to be down year on year uh, in Q4 2020 based on current projections? So 50% uh, went for 10 to 20%, uh, 34%, 21 to 40%. And then you can see the variance either side. And do you believe that accident repair costs will increase as a result of a reset post COVID? Yes, probable 53%, no doubt for 10%. And maybe, but competition will apply a downward pressure, 37%. So again, plenty to talk around there, I am sure, from the panellists today. So I'm going to jump across to you first, Sean. Um, anything there kind of stand out? I know you took part in the, uh, in the survey last week. So any particular thoughts on, on what we've just looked at in terms of those results? Well, my first thought... <clears throat> is I never thought that in any time in my life I'd sit on a call and hear that Scunthorpe was a hotspot. <laughs> no disrespect to the good folks from Scunthorpe, but it's not something I ever thought I'd hear. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think the entire ecosystem, everybody in our industry, be it insurers, OEMs, repairers, supply chain folks, are guessing and best guessing and uh, hovering and hoping on the type of data that Kevin and uh, and Integral are being able to bring to the market, and 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 the you know the snapshot that you did last week on on the Arc uh, survey. Again, people are hanging on any piece of data that will give them some clarity or some direction as to where the market's going to. It's going to be what it's going to be. Um, you know, we can't predict spikes. We can't predict how this is going to either just, uh, you know, medically make its way out of, out of our lives or, or continue to be part of our lives for a long time to come. So any, any research, any information is, is very, very valuable. I'd concur that I think we'll be down about, I think we're, get, we're forcing ourselves to get back to about 80% of, our, of what we previously did. Um, and that means that some people are doing just 20% and some people are all in and full on, right? So um, I think driving is down here. Uh, we know frequency is uh, really still down very much. However, those that are crashing are crashing at higher speeds and killing each other and, and doing some terrible things. So there's just such a mixed bag mark of data that we're all kind of hanging on any survey we get, any information we're able to, to glean from the market. What's been encouraging is there have been a lot of companies, insurers in particular, that have stepped up during this uh, time to share that type of information. So uh, does it all, anything in particular, and you know, joke about Scunthorpe aside, that there is a confidence, there is a, it's not the doom and gloom that it was back in February and March. There is some light at some end of some tunnel somewhere, and we've just got to figure it out as best we can for our individual businesses. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Ian, Ian, over to you in terms of what uh, what we've just seen. I mean, does that resonate uh, with with Zurich, obviously in the UK, but but specifically, what, you know, wider afield? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 picking kind of, I guess, three different things from the survey. There, I, I was interested to see the planning horizons, um, and I, I think we're all there. It doesn't matter whether you're, you know, a big company or a smaller company. You're, you're trying to manage in the moment during the instance of lockdown and just trying to work out just how to keep ticking over day to day. But invariably for the UK and other countries as we come out of lockdown, then we start to lift our heads up and go, okay, so what next? Uh, and Sean's, you know, hit the nail on the head. The challenge we have here is just so much uncertainty. You know, people talk about going back to business as usual. It's new business as usual. There won't be a business as usual that, that we're used to. And, that level of uncertainty is really difficult when you're managing a business, when you're uh, you know, leading any aspect of the business. So, you know, we're all in the same boat with that. And as leaders, we're used to looking at the patterns of the past to lay out on the current, to predict the future. And then, of course, we're in new patterns. So 
you know, there's a lot that goes on to that. And, and we might talk about, you know, the human angle on things later on in the discussions. But, but coming back to the survey, um, the volume piece is really interesting. I mean, one of the things that we did really early on, I mean, we, 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 we have what we call a cat code, that, that if there is anything that could have an implication outside of a particular country um, because of its nature or because of uh, the potential scale, um, uh, so a hurricane or something like that, we, we will designate globally a catastrophe code, a cat code. So we put a cat code on COVID-19 on the 27th of January when we started to see some of our international uh, companies being impacted by what seemed to be a localised virus like SARS and, and the other uh, terrible things that have happened before. So what that meant is we started to collect data from January onwards and we could see the kind of the wave going through Asia, moving into Europe and then sweeping through North America and now down into Latin America. So we've been able to kind of match the patterns and, and I'm sure Sean, is, you know, it's got the same thing from a VM perspective, but, it, but it's been really interesting to see the dramatic drop off in new claims notifications. I was just looking at the data yeah, um, just before the call because we've been tracking um, what we've been seeing on, on motor and what the volume's been tracking like. And in Italy and in Spain, if you look April to April 2019 versus 2020, 80% redu plus reduction in new claims notified for motor damage. Um, so you know, it's been pretty, it, 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 it's like literally off a cliff. And then we're seeing the patterns come back. And I think... Again, we love certainty, but I think we're going to see a number of things. I think the bounce back is going to happen to a degree. You know, people are avoiding public transport. You know, in Germany, in Switzerland, the queues are back on the roads and, the, you know, the gridlock and the, and the challenges are, are there. Um, uh, I know just driving around uh, on the South Coast, you know, um, whereas a couple of weeks ago, just doing those essential trips, you know, the, the roads were completely clear. Now we can see the traffic coming back. So I think we're going to see that pick up. Um, which inevitably is going to lead to uh, a pickup in, in repair requirements. I think as well, we've got a backlog to work through. I think there will be knocks and scrapes and bangs that would happen and people want to keep mobile so they don't really want to register their claim and lose the mobility in an insult in certain environments. So I think we're going to see a clean up the backlog. What the new normal looks like with roads turned over to cyclists, um, uh, you know, a real focus on um, uh, the sustainability of our transport networks and how that's going to play out. Maybe not this year, but, but kind of moving forward, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what impact that has on, on motors as a mode of transport and, and longer term patterns. But I do, you know, on another angle, we, we, you know, we talked about more people having fewer accidents, but more at high speed and therefore more bodily injuries. What we've seen in the past as well is that, that maybe during recessions or, or things like that, people turn over to walking or cycling. And we can see that, you know, uh, prevalent. And what we also see, therefore, is when things start to tick up again, an increase in bodily injuries, vehicle on, pedestrian vehicle on, cyclist accidents as well. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Ian. And uh, Sean, I'll, I'll come back to you in terms of, if you put your kind of vehicle manufacturer hat on for, for a moment, um, you know, we've not heard a great deal from vehicle manufacturers in terms of the ARC 360 uh, webinars over the past you know, few weeks. Can you give us an insight into into their world? You know, we've we've seen the headlines of factories, uh, you know, temporarily closing down, uh, production halting. But, uh, you know, and obviously there was a huge problem in terms of the UK, in terms of parts availability. Um, but but how, are, you know, how are they experiencing things? How are they finding things and what is likely to be? you know, the, the short, the medium and the long-term impact on all of this on, on, the, on them? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, so my buddies, the, the OEMs, they, they kind of went into shock mode, right? They're, they're like, like just about everybody, I guess, they, the predictability sort of highlighted itself from China. And, and the first I ever heard of it was one of the OEMs that I do business with was saying that, you know, hey, this might have an impact on our China sales, and we're pretty reliant on China sales for, for volumes. Um, and the innocence of those types of comments back then now seems so uh, prevalent of, you know, this might impact our China business a little bit. Uh, and it turns out that four weeks later, factories across the world are shut down, no cars are being produced, no parts are being shipped, and so on and so forth. So, um, <clears throat> well, the OEMs went into shock, right? So not only couldn't they have anticipated, as none of us could, the, the depth of this, 
what they weren't able to react to quickly enough and still are trying to recover and, and, and find their, their place here is the ongoing sort of tale of what shutting a factory down means to an OEM. So beyond everything else, those of us that, that live in and around the OEM world realize that if you don't produce a car, you don't generate any revenue. And, you know, far be it from the sort of sell what you produce, you know, produce what you sell type of thing. Um, there is a great deal of production planning goes into place and volumes are predicted and, and needs and, ident and identifying markets are predicted. You have to understand that that's just completely thrown out of kilter. And so there are used, huge stockpiles of vehicles sitting around, be it in dealer inventories or, or uh, OEM inventories. The first thing that happens then is when the factories close down, we're not shipping new vehicles. So if you just think about that in just for a while, just take, put, put an OEM hat on. Here are this year, there'll be 4 million less shipments of vehicles than there were in the US market. Globally, there'll be something in the region of 35 million less vehicle shipments. Um, as the OEs do their production planning, they plan with their supply chain for all of those vehicles. Uh, and it's like, how do you stop and start that? It's, it's a really difficult thing to do. Secondly, the moment it leaves the factory floor, the OEMs switch into after sales mode, right? And so they are now predicting uh, here in the US, I'll use the US, it's the same for the UK, trust me. Um, here are 4 million vehicles that would have been on the road this year that in 2021, we would have been selling service parts for, we would have been selling, you know, 93% uh, collision repair parts of those that got into a crash. Um, this is a very healthy business for us. It keeps the doors open at the, the head offices. Um, and for five, six, seven, ten years onwards, we would have had an income live stream out of that particular vehicle. Um, well, there's four million of them missing. That's $166 billion dollars worth of immediate economic impact, faced by probably at least a further $166 billion of ongoing tail economic impact. Uh, Ian, Zurich farmers won't get to insure them. They, those vehicles won't be insured. They won't be underwritten. Um, so, you know, as I say, without the car, we're nothing. Nobody in our business without the vehicle has got a job. Um, it all starts with the vehicle from the moment it's conceived to the moment the last bit of plastic and metal and juice is squeezed out of it. It is the economic engine that drives all of our businesses, um, whether you're in the insurance business, the repair business, the supply chain business. Um, we are there because there is a vehicle. And so when you start to shut down that capacity, um, albeit involuntary, it, has a, it will have a significant tail of economic disruption to the industry for years to come. So OEMs are, how do we get back to producing vehicles and producing parts because we're running short? And in every dealership now, there is a shortage of key model vehicles across the world. That's, that's pretty evident. Number two, <coughs> wow, we're not going to sell as many vehicles as we'd anticipated not only had we anticipated, we had planned and pre-production for and post-production projected what we would earn as a result of those vehicles being in the marketplace. Now what do we do? And oh, in the meantime, how do we get parts to people that need them badly? How do we make face masks? How do we build ventilators? How do we support a community and a society so that we are stepping up as a brand and doing the right thing? Um, you can just begin, Mark, to imagine the depth of challenge this is to large organizations on whom the lifeblood of our industry exists. So it's tough. They're going through those three phases right now. You know, I'm talking with the OEMs on a daily basis. And um, even from just the parts and collision side, it's a, it's a real challenge in trying to predict what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. And oh, in the meantime, how can we support our dealers and repair shops? It's, it's a tough business. And all the time, I imagine, trying to um, second guess that kind of human behavior element in terms of what that will actually drive in the market. Yeah, let me just, I'll take just 30 seconds on that. So that's, that's those folks that are 
mainly preoccupied with the the operations of the business. Let's go over to the glass halls of the design studios and the, the future model studios. Um, they are sitting there and they are trying to interpret exactly what Ian said. What will society want to do beyond 2020 and into 2021 and 2022 and 2023? And so I think we'll see some leapfrog um, innovation. So, you know, the OEMs are typically about four or five years ahead of where the market is in terms of what innovation they have. You know, I was sitting in driverless cars, be it in Gothenburg or Detroit or California, uh, you know, five or six years ago. They, they were there, they were capable, they could stop up to a millimeter or 30 millimeters uh, apart from each other. Um, EVs was clearly the route they were going. And so I think what we might see is depending on consumer sentiment, depending on consumer behavior, which I'm looking forward to hearing what Ian's got to say, the OEMs will probably leapfrog a technology or two. But we will see, without any shadow of a doubt, we will see in um, what we would call run-of-the-mill model vehicles here, uh, you know, at a $12,000, £12,000 car, we will see that fully spec with ADAS or automatic uh, capabilities, whether it's fully functional or not to be determined, but they will leapfrog all of that technology into the new vehicle releases. They're going to have to. Interesting. Great insight there, Sean. Thank you very much. Ian, we'll, we'll come across to you on that note then, because Sean's led us into it quite nicely. Mm -hmm. But um, you, you'd sort of touched upon uh, previously in a conversation we had how the Zurich management team, you have yeah, your, your regular catch-ups and identify different activity from different regions around, around the globe. Can you tell us a little bit more about the insight that those, those kind of meetings that, that you're gleaning from those, and what you're learning? Yeah, sure. Um, so picking up on the human behavior piece, I think as, as we, as many of our competitors and, you know, many in the market try to do is you, you keep trying to service your customer. You've had to probably definitely adapt uh, and probably adopt some technology that maybe was in pilot stage or somebody talks about but you never implemented in and then rush it to get in. And, and one of the big things for us has been remote assessment. Um, now, look, I'm not suggesting that this is, this is new technology, far, far from it. But part of the challenge that's been around remote, uh, uh, remote assessment has quite often been the customer reluctance to use their own phone to take a picture or a video or to not accept that they're not going to see a physical motor engineer coming around and checking something out or, you know, don't worry, take it to the repair shop. It'll all get sorted out there and they don't really get that, that human interaction. Now, Different markets behave in different ways, but it was really interesting to hear from our colleagues in Germany where they were struggling to get 20% adoption for remote assessment, video assessment um, in the market there before COVID hit. And now, of course, uh, that's completely changed. It's 60% plus of people saying, yeah, absolutely delighted. Um, you know, I'd rather not see anybody. Um, and I think, therefore, if you, if you build out from that, what I think we are seeing is an acceleration of the acceptance of doing things remotely um, of very, you know, a, a lot of different nature. I mean, we've all probably expanded the amount that we're shopping online. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, we could have had our own Amazon Prime van over the last couple of weeks just for the deliveries of stuff that we've been getting through. But, you know, we've all been doing it or, or you know, the move back to the single trip to the supermarkets to do the weekly shop compared to, to where things are developing. So I think the human elements and for, for us in, uh, in motor insurance, motor repair, the, you know, the motor ecosystem is, is going to change dramatically. And I think we're going to find a much more um, willing um, uh, consumer base for um, automation and, and integration and remote assessment. And I think that in itself is going to change the shape of the way we, we think about operating. Definitely. And Sean, you've, you've kind of mentioned experience of that in terms of the US market. Um, there seems to be a big uptake in terms of remote estimating or, or activity. Is that right? Yeah, we, we are, you know, if you take again, we're grasping any data that we can get. CCC just released a, uh, an information piece the other week that said that up to as much as 80% of claims are being uh, 
at least initially assessed and, um, and estimated remotely, so digitally. And, and I think, again, as, as Ian rightly said, sometimes we are testing and testing and piloting and piloting, and, and the, every single insurance company, Zurich certainly for sure, and, and all of the major brands that, that are international and both the U.S. live in, um, have had this capability for some time. They've been working with the third-party vendors and providers of this technology for a long, long time, and they've probably tried it in Minnesota on you know this region and see how it goes and let's not upset the customer you know if they don't want to take a photo don't make them take a photo for god sake um and and suddenly events overtook us and and it became an absolute necessity and hey guess what it would well um to the extent that you know repairers aren't terribly happy because they they're not convinced that they're getting the right sort of uh the right type of, of detail on the estimate. And that's where I think ultimately with 80% of these initial assessments being done remotely with the AI companies starting to come through the tractables and various others that have made reasonably good headway into the marketplace. They've still got a lot to learn about the car. And, and again, you know, I keep coming back to the car and, and it's a, it's an old drum I beat. But, but if, we, if we respect the car, then we're all going to be okay. Um, and when we disrespect the car, that's when we start getting off uh, a bit squirrely, right? And we're, we're not here to, to see who pees highest up the pot here. But, but if we stay on true to the car, then we're in good shape, right? So AI can do so much. Uh, and virtual estimating can do so much. So it makes absolute sense. Every sense. the world to me that Sean you're dipping in and out there it's an OEMs oh. we've lost you for a moment there Sean we'll come back to you and should, should I pick up Ian if you could pick up that would be fabulous yeah look, pick it up on on something that, that Sean was saying there and um, the, there may be a few people who still remember before when I was operating in the UK market um, Sean made a really really valid point which is great that insurers are coming out with remote assessment and all these great innovations but if they're not actually linking in with repair shops and saying how do we make this work together then it's not going to work for the customer it's not going to work for the insurer and it's certainly not going to work, work for the repair centre so, yeah, a big part of what we've been striving to do, and I say striving because I don't think we can do it, um, uh, you know, as, as well as we would hope, is, is trying to build through this adversity, is link in with our suppliers, including uh, our repair, uh, repair teams and, and, and others in the, in the ecosystem, um, to touch base and find out how things are working, but also to work out how we can help that our repair centres work effectively with us in this environment. And, you know, I have long complained um, and challenged my own people around, you know, the adversarial uh, environment that you often find in this. But uh, look, I really hope that one of the things that will behaviourally different out of this is that when we all find ourselves in the same boat around this stuff, it's forced a collaboration that maybe normal environment hasn't uh, hasn't done and therefore i really hope that what we will see is that more thinking about okay if you take it from the customer perspective how do we jointly work to deliver what the customer is looking for because we can deploy all the technology we want but if it doesn't work for the customer then it's not actually going to work effectively and we can deploy all the remote assessments we want but then if you know the, uh, the customer ships in and um the the, the the strip happens and we find there's a load of stuff that we weren't aware of because it's just a photograph um, and we don't adapt to that, then then we're failing the customer, and we're going to you know elongate the process, which um, nobody wants. So, uh, look, I think the key thing here is we've got to work together to 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 develop these um, these solutions, and also recognise it's not one size fits all. So there are times in which you do need the human touch, you do need physical motor engineering capability on site, uh, and you do need to have those discussions with the body shops. Okay, great stuff. I think we've got Sean back now. Um, Sean, we, we touched upon, obviously, the, if you like, the, the cost implications or, or you know, the, the spread out, if you like, impact on vehicle manufacturers. And I mentioned how 
supply of parts had been a challenge certainly in the UK um, again tell us a little bit about how that has been in the US but has the industry kind of been spooked by what happened and do you think VMs have perhaps now taken a different look at those channels those supply channels themselves is there new ways of thinking do you think afoot where they think actually you know we need more reliability uh, I think what they what they didn't anticipate is the shift to e-commerce ordering uh, nearly as much as they did right so in the OEM world we're still you know god bless us um, rather Neanderthal in terms of the phone and the fax and, and somewhat reliant on it for parts of orders. Um, dealers necessarily embraced, nor of shops, to be truthful. They hadn't necessarily embraced e-commerce ordering um, because shops tend to have this viewpoint of, I want to know that they've got the part, that I can get the part, that the part is the right part. And so the only way I can do that is either physically send a fax over or telephone. I don't want to trust that the button I've pressed will mean that the right part turns up tomorrow morning because if it's the wrong part, it has a significant impact on me. So I think where the OEMs will, I know where the OEMs will are going to focus and they're going to focus on that. How do we convert, given that we can't do anything other than go through our dealer networks because of the franchise laws, whether you're, doesn't, again, doesn't matter where you are in the world. Um, how do we, make a more robust e-commerce platform that it can accurately identify the part and provide a level of guarantee and comfort to the repair shops that the right part is going to turn up at the right time. I think Mr. Bezos comes into that. Uh, I think we change our delivery systems, our mechanisms of getting parts to market. Um, you know, I mentioned Amazon earlier. The business model... <coughs> will simply have to be replicated by any business doing e-commerce. Now, whether it's Jeff's vans or GM's vans, it kind of doesn't matter anymore. We're, we're kind of getting over ourselves in the fact that, you know, 15 different vans turning up at a repair shop is completely inefficient uh, and not necessary because, you know, the 3M vans got to turn up and then the LKQ Keystone vans got to turn up. And the Ford and the GM and the Chrysler van has got to turn up. It's, you know, I think what this has done is enabled us to think a little more practically, a little more pragmatically about how to solve issues. In terms of the part shortages, again, it was the shock. I think we spent January, those inside large organizations such as Ian, such as a vehicle manufacturer, spent January trying to assess whether this was a China problem or whether this was a real thing that was a, was a come in our way. By the time we got to February, it was too late to do anything substantial about it. And by the time you're at March, you've got distribution centers shut down, you've got roads not being used, you've got trucks sitting idle that would otherwise be delivering vehicles, you've got dealerships furloughing staff and pretty much closing down their businesses. And we had a whole range of reactions from different individuals that, that caused supply chain problems. You know, distribution companies shut down. It was, uh, my understanding was it was, it was difficult to get things like paint and paper products and consumables and everything else because you had to fish and find for those and certain distribution centers were closing down on, a, on an ad hoc basis. What we've learned is we'll get more pragmatic. And we've got the parts, we being the parts are made, they're manufactured, they are somewhere in the system. And there is a buyer, and provided the electronic commerce platform can, work, can, can be accurate enough, we just have to find, logistics is not beyond us now, we just have to find how we get part A to, to buyer B in the most efficient and quickest way without going through all of those normal brand touch channels that we do, which I think brings me on to ultimately, as we tail out of this, supply chain will change significantly. Um, I see a future where supply chain has to face its demon. And that is 20 years ago, you added value in the middle and now that value is far less than it ever was. 
how do you recreate a different value and add that back in in order to survive? Because the cars are still going to be made, the vehicles are still going to be insured, and they're going to crash and get repaired. How do the suppliers to all of those particular, you know, three core entities, how do they play their role in the future? And in your survey, I put 12 months and beyond. Now, simple for me, I'm a one guy consulting business out of Chicago, but I strategically advise some pretty large organizations on where to go in their whole supply chain and, and future in the industry. Um, I think if you're not taking some foresight, even though we have to plan for next week and we have to plan for a month's time, that's the operational side. If we're not taking some foresight, and the same is true in shops, the same is true whether you sell paint, sell parts, um, sell equipment or anything into the ecosystem, you have to sit back for five minutes here at some point in time and say, what does this mean to the future? And we've learned to become pragmatic. We've, we've allowed ourselves, thank God, to become, why on earth do we do that? We, we don't need to do that. We can just do that. Wow. And it works. Oh, my God. We're in trouble now. So that's where I think we are. So out of shock, ran out of parts, out of necessity, we will change the supply chain functionality and distribution of those. So thanks very much, Sean. Ian, I'll come across to you because I can see you nodding in agreement with Sean there in terms of what he's just said. Does, this, does it resonate with you in terms of that kind of sentiment across the business and what you're obviously hearing from, from your global management team? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I, I mean, I, I would, um, Sean said, you know, so the challenges that you guys um, uh, joining, um, participating in this will know far better than I, but I would say I actually think the supply chains have held up more than I expected them to. So there is a good deal of credit, I think, to the car manufacturers, um, OEMs, who have found ways to make things work. I mean, I, I can't speak for... Um, those organisations that, that Sean's close to, but but I'm you know I know manufacturers that swapped out of manufacturing, but changed the changed the prioritisation away from the manufacturing new vehicles and into parts because they could see the challenge, uh, and um, people have found a way through. But the, this this disruption, I mean, if you think about it, so much is still shipped by sea. This disruption is going to go on for months yet because what we were having landing, you know, a month ago probably left, you know, eight to 12 weeks ago from China if it was coming by sea. Um, and so we're going to see disruption. I mean, you, uh, I know as well, I mean, simple things as well, which are going to cause a challenge is, is the containers are all in the wrong place. Um, you know, the, the global shipping works on the basis, um, you know, a bit like Eddie Stobart built his business up on, which is you never have something empty. It's always moved with something in. And now we've got piles of crates um, and containers sitting in exactly the wrong place to enable the supply chains to kick in again. It is simple logistical things like this that, that are going to create an ongoing challenge. And look, I, I, I think we should take great strength from the way that we've all responded to this environment in which we've found ways to make things work. And Sean's absolutely right. This is going to have to drive a difference. And we're going to have to come together to, to address that because um, nobody expected this to happen. As Sean described, you know, um, I for one thought it was just another bit of flu going around in China and, you know, how wrong was I? Um, but where we are now. Um, but I think it's taught us a lot of lessons around assumptions uh, and confidence we have in, in infrastructure and logistical networks that operate and how resilient they truly are. But I think as well, there's a lot which is we can point to, you know, X in the supply chain and Y in the supply chain. Again, we are all in this together. So we have to work out collaboratively how we're all going to work to actually create a more resilient model going forward, because we don't know when the next shock is going to come. And, um, you know, God forbid, but we could see a second wave of COVID. We could see uh, a mutation. I don't, you know, I work in insurance, so that, and, and insurance claims is the worst part. Somebody once said, if you don't, want, if you don't enjoy giving people bad news, don't work in claims. Um, but, um, you know, the, the reality is, is that I think that we've learned a lot of lessons around what business resilience really means. And we need to look to our own part in that chain and work out how we can be more resilient but we're going to make that work by being more resilient together and picking up the points that Sean has made. Mark, can I just add something there? Yeah, of course, can Sean. Uh, it's, it's a great point. Uh, and what I'm hearing and, and what I'm telling, you know, anybody that will care to listen to me 
is the greatest danger, the biggest risk we run now is going back to what we did before. It, it really, uh, and I know it sounds very consultancy and, you know, hey, don't go back to what you did before. But I, I genuinely mean it. I think we have learned and been forced to do so many great different things. My wife said to me, how can Ford go from making cars one day to making, you know, 100,000 ventilators the next day? And I said, because when, when companies decide that they'll take down the patents and they'll down the commercial you know, barriers to, to that and show Ford, say Ford, here's the plans, here's how you build a ventilator. Then Ford can go out and build 100,000 ventilators in a, in a heartbeat because they're engineers by heart. There's 22,000 engineers sitting over there in Detroit somewhere. Um, so it's that cooperation. It's that level of commitment to working together that's going to make this a much more efficient and effective ecosystem, you know, uh, from the moment the vehicle's built until the moment it's crushed through all of its cycle of insurance and claims and Ian breaking hearts for 25 years in claims. I get it. That's what your job is to break people's hearts, but it needn't necessarily be on a case by case claim by claim basis. I think we can really work together to, to better understand how to underwrite these vehicles, how to properly address them when they, when they are in need of repair. I had a question here on salvage. I'll answer it live. Yes, there's a place for it. Of course, there's a place for it. Um, provided it's an engineering solution, not a cost solution. And I, I say that, you know, passionately. We, we try and find too many cost solutions to the repair cycle. And we have to find engineering solutions. So if a recycled part, a salvaged part is, is in good shape, can do the function, is uh, functionally will work alongside the rest of the parts in the vehicle, knock yourself out. It's a great part. The OEMs aren't going to be, you know, crushed about that. They'll sell enough parts going forward. Um, but, but the danger is, and I'll just come back to it, if, if we just go back, if we creep back as we do, and, and the human behavioralists amongst us will know that we'll have a tendency to do this. But if we creep back to what it was before, that's the biggest danger as I see it. I think bold steps. Do you think, do you think Sean, just whilst we're on the note of, uh, of green parts or recycled parts, will, will the VMs show more of an interest in that, in that side of the market? Would they be sort of more keen to get involved in terms of what we've already spoken about, that this potential lag issue? I don't know is the answer. Um, I, I, it, it is, here's, here's, their, their problem is, I mean, the OEMs look at the, the world of parts, right? And, and everybody thinks, you know, oh, they're you know, screwing the world over on parts. It's an incredibly profitable part of the business for them because they're able to make them in such mass. You know, if, if you've got a sheet, bit of sheet metal, uh, a, roll of, a roll of steel, or aluminum, or whatever you want to call it, aluminium, I guess I should say on this call, um, and you can convert that into 5,000 parts, then your costs are obviously fairly, fairly low. Um, uh, and so it is an incredibly profitable element of the business for them. Where they are most concerned um, is one, on brand retention, and two, on safety and eff effectiveness of the, the vehicle, in, in no particular order, by the way, safety of the vehicle clearly has been a shocker to all of them. Um, and so they will look at it and say, we don't know that these aftermarket parts work, right? So hence the battle begins. You've now immediately introduced friction back into that, that commentary, that narrative it alone introduces friction. We're not sure the aftermarket parts are functional and work alongside the vehicle as it should do. And all of these ADIS components don't work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they can't really say that, provided it's model base for model base and year for year, you know, i.e. there's no change in, in, um, in uh, what it is. it's not been supplemented out differently. If, if it's an OEM part that's come off a used ve a vehicle that's been salvaged, then they can't argue with that. So I don't think that's where their argument is. I think they'll look at it. I don't think they'll want to get into that market. I don't think they'll want to address it there are other things that they would prefer to address. And, you know, this week alone, there's a cars coalition that says, ah, oh, the OEMs aren't looking to share data. And I'm paraphrasing, don't sue me anybody over here. Um, 
they're not looking to, to share data and that means that they'll force the cost of repairs up and customers won't have choice. And oh, by the way, parts are too expensive. It's like, uh, there's no logic in that. There's no symmetry in that of, of what it means to the consumer, the vehicle, or at the end of the day, either the OEM or the parts manufacturer or the aftermarket parts manufacturer. Very long answer. I don't think they'll get into salvage. I think they wish it would go away, to be perfectly truthful. Um, but if they were to embrace it, don't forget Ford bought the salvage business out here in the US many years ago and made a complete balls of it by, by getting too corporate. Um, it's a market that functions pretty well, right? You know, it, it, it's a market that takes about 7 to 10% of the parts business over here in the US. Yeah. Um, and it functions pretty well. Why get involved in it? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic, Sean. God, we could, uh, us, we could talk all day, I know. Um, Ian, we've kind of got, what, seven or eight minutes left on the clock. Just wanted to come back to you in terms of, and again, probably drilling down a little bit more, but in terms of that kind of specific claims insight that you've got from various regions around the world, um, we touched on it in terms of the survey. There was a uh, sort of disparity in terms of what people thought were going to happen with claims costs increase, or was it going to be leveled out by competition within the market? But frequencies, costs, incident types, what are you kind of seeing from, from various regions right now? Yeah, I mean, we, we're in danger of, of falling foul of our own analysis here because um, we quite often work on average costs. Uh, and of course, what happens is when you lose those low, high volume, low values, then it looks like all of a sudden your costs have gone up. But the net net is, you know, costs are down. Um, and uh, frequency is down in those countries that have been impacted. And as I highlighted earlier, I mean, you know, we, we're kind of coming out of lockdown in the UK and in Europe, um, North America, you know, not quite sure where that's at, um, but, but Latin America is still deep in this. Um, and so different countries are still managing this um, uh, and the implications of it. So look, I, I think broadly speaking, we, we kicked off a supply chain risk management call globally every week in the first six weeks and then moved to fortnightly and have been monitoring internal and external data around uh, inflational claims, uh, parts inflation, supply chain challenges. Um, that's where I was deriving my comment earlier um, around actually the supply chains have held up Re, uh, you know, better than we anticipated, um, and and things were still able to tick over. Um, but um, I think invariably there are going to be a number of factors that will come into play here, which is any shortage is going to create um, uh, an increase in cost at some point in, in the supply chain. I think the other challenge that you know is a reality, and it's been something that repair sector has had to struggle with for for many years now. Is is you know keeping the business going in these kind of environments is, is extremely tough. Um, oh, there's no way I want to tell anybody in this call about you know the challenges they have in their business, but I know margins are really tight, and with that, therefore, um, creates risks and dangers. So you know, will we see business failures, and therefore, will we see um, a, a dry up in in supply capacity? Uh, and with that, we're gonna, will that lead to any further consolidation? All those will play in through um, on all of the markets in which we operate. Um, I think the, the broader context as well is what are the responses going to be to some of the challenges now in terms of the, uh, considering it, uh, the challenge on globalization and how things are operating and, and the need to bring things closer to home, maybe, to, to provide that resilience that I just talked about. Or, in, you know, moving from some of the very optimal just-in-time um, supply chains to something that, that has more built-in resilience in terms of the ability, as Sean talked about, is to, you know, maybe to switch quickly if you need to, but also to have more stock, um, you know, through that supply chain. Um, invariably, I think there are going to be upwards pressures on, on, on the input costs around, um, uh, around repairs, uh, and that's invariably going to play through. Um, that's a gut feeling. Can I point to data going back to where Sean started? The problem is I could point to any data I liked and pick out a set that would support my particular argument. So I'll be a bit more pragmatic than that and go, that's my hypothesis. Um, of course, next time we actually get the chance to be in the same place with a, with a bar in front of us, 
either I can I'll buy somebody else a pint because I got it wrong or you can buy me a pint because I, I got it right. Probably the truth is somewhere between the two. But um, it is clear um, that there are going to be challenges on the way we've operated in the past that we've highlighted throughout this call and, and Sean's made some you know, hugely valuable uh, points and provided some fantastic insights around that. And um, we're going to have to work our way through this and those pricing pressures will come. That will invariably be passed on by some route or other. If we've got a shrinking car park, that means that um, you know, the, the amount of product that we sell, motor insurance is going to reduce. Um, what's that actually going to mean for the resilience of the insurance marketplace, let alone anything else? And um, uh, you know, the, the most successful body shops are the ones that are, are diversifying as, uh, as much as possible or forming really good alliances. Um, but, um, you know, I'd say to all of you is, you know, just look to the dynamics that are going on in the market, see what's happening. And um, I think, you know, for, it's not just um, small, medium-sized enterprises that have got challenges in this market. I think there are a number of big players that will also have challenges in this market. We'll see a lot of change over the next five to ten years, um, uh, and that includes in the broader business environments and insurance. Brilliant. What a way to bring this one to a close, and I'm sure we could probably um, – talk for another hour or two amongst us. So maybe, uh, you know, if you guys are agreeable, we'll perhaps set up another date sometime in the future to, to get you both back involved um, and, and continue the conversation. Does, does that involve me buying a pint at some point? Is that what you're trying to say? Mark? I don't like to say too much, but yes. Um, so that would be fantastic. And uh, I hope everyone who's joined us today has uh, really taken something from that fantastic contribution from uh, Ian and Sean there. Some really, really good insights. Um, we, again, are just wrapping things up now. So thank you very much for joining us. This has been week 17 of our uh, webinars thus far. This will be a recording will be live uh, by close of play today or first thing tomorrow. And it will also be converted into an audio file. So uh, when you're busy back at work, you can have these uh, dulcet tones in your ears instead. And uh, again, once again, big thank you to Ian Big thank you to Sean for your contributions today. It's been fantastic. Hopefully we can catch up again in, uh, in some weeks' time or a little further down the line and uh, we won't hold you to any of the uh, predictions that you've made today. Huge thank you to our corporate partners and our partners once again. And thank you very much for everyone for joining us. Take care and we'll see you all again next Wednesday. Cheers, guys.